Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the virtual space of the Irwin S. Shannon School of Architecture. Uh, my name is Nader Tehrani, uh, and I'm honored to serve as the Dean of the school uh, and welcome, to, welcome you to our open house. Um, uh, being a very small school, uh, we tend to communicate quite intimately. I see students uh, online right now, I see teachers, uh, and really today uh, is a day uh, of conversations uh, to understand the nature and the culture uh, of the school, uh, to get to know us better. Uh, and usually uh, I have found that the alignments that are created in these spaces are what tend to determine the outcome of admissions. Um, it's not easy uh, to welcome you to a virtual space, but I trust that all of you uh, are going through the same thing that we are going through. It hasn't been easy. Uh, and yet beyond coping with the situation, what I've discovered in, in my faculty and in my students uh, is a form of resilience not merely to adapt to the situation, but really to catalyze uh, and to create out of it opportunities, such as the end of year show that we had just a few months ago, uh, a, a virtual uh, exhibit like no other that was effectively uh, curated and conjured up in the last minutes of, of last semester to a, a set of results which I just found completely inspiring. Uh, those same set of circumstances happen now in our breakout rooms, uh, spaces that even our own architecture could not produce, and effectively an intimacy uh, that we often don't get to have in the larger conversations. Uh, uh, we are now all restricted to this uh, picture plane that divides us, uh, but in fact, uh, I like to think of this picture plane as the very uh, space of representation, uh, the picture plane on which we all draw together, uh, sharing with the students something that I never got to do before. So um, while I hope and trust that this is not our ultimate fate, uh, I think the project that we have together here and now uh, is an important one, uh, and we must find ways in which to address it uh, inventively. Uh, it is no secret that um, uh, the architecture school uh, of the Cooper Union has had a, a long and uh, inspiring history uh, founded by John Haydock uh, and extended through the years through the leadership of uh, Anthony Wittler, uh, Elizabeth O'Donnell, uh, and then uh, I came uh, to inherit this position um, uh, ours uh, is, is, is a position uh, about a pedagogy that takes root at the core of studio uh, while inviting the arts, uh, the sciences, the humanities into a space of exchange. Uh, we uh, try to bring uh, as many disciplines into the studio to imagine uh, an expanded definition of what we call the architectural discipline. You'll find yourselves uh, quite commonly in a space of exchange that is not like no other classroom that you've probably been in. And the critique uh, is uh, the space of exchange where students not only present their work, uh, but get to comment on each other's work, uh, debate positions, uh, and effectively create a, a horizontality between that uh, of the faculty and the students. Uh, and in that sense, in the context of the studio, we do not only try to create extraordinary designers, we also think uh, it is important to create critical um, individuals with a, an, an insight into the underpinnings of what creates forms, spaces, and the cultural environments that we inhabit. In the context of Cooper Union, uh, we do not only think uh, about design, we believe in making. Uh, and uh, the fourth floor, uh, a space that you'll see sh uh, soon in the tour, uh, is really one of those wonderful spaces uh, that students get acquainted with 
from their very first day uh, at the Cooper Union uh, in constructions in wood, uh, metal, uh, casting, and digital fabrications with the expanded ACE lab, uh, we think through making. Now that is important for our individual works, but it's also important in the way that we're able to impact the construction industry. It would be an understatement to say that uh, the space of representation uh, is not only uh, the, the conduit, the medium through which architecture often happens. Architects draw uh, more than they build themselves. Uh, but in fact, that space of representation is, uh, is anything but static. Over the evolution of time and history, we have seen new inventions of ways to map the world, to document spaces around us, uh, and in fact, to represent the world. Uh, from the perspective uh, that we see the world today, uh, from the perspectives of social justice, uh, of Black Lives Matter, uh, and uh, uh, of the cultural spaces of decolonization that we are all experiencing right now, that representation is not only technical, it is also cultural. So a lot of our recent efforts have also been trying to expand the cultural space from which we look at the making of forms of spaces and the materialities that inspire architecture. And finally, to close out, before I hand over the mic to Haley, uh, I'd like to think of Cooper Union uh, as a space of pedagogy. We don't only teach at the Cooper Union, we create a space of learning. So much so that many, many uh, of the graduates uh, of the Cooper Union go on uh, to graduate schools. Uh, they, they become teachers in, in all institutions, uh, all parts of the world, and effectively become chairs, deans, and people that contribute uh, to the experiments uh, that, is the, that is the experiment of education. Uh, and so I'd like to think that we come here together uh, to Cooper Union, not just you, but people like myself to remain students. So with that, uh, let me introduce Haley Eber, the Associate Dean of the School of Architecture, uh, and I will later join you in conversation on a one-to-one -one basis as we go through the other programs. Welcome again. Thank you, Nader. Uh, yes, welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us today on this peculiar Sunday, post Halloween, pre-election with daylight savings time. Um, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of our curriculum, um, which is on the website. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, but our Bachelor of Architecture curriculum is designed to provide students with a comprehensive all-round educational experience gaining knowledge and skills for the successful and ethical practice of architecture. The design studios are essentially the anchor of each year and together with the courses, they build cumulatively over the five years in order to gain a broad and deep foundation of knowledge in architecture and urban design together with um, the sciences, arts and technology. Our curriculum stresses the importance of architecture as a humanistic discipline and this is concerned with the design and construction of habitats in diverse social and ecological conditions. And so we recalibrate it regularly to respond to a changing world and an evolving profession. So what you'll see in the images later and hear more about through the course of this morning is the combination of traditional skills of drawing, model making and design development that are complemented by analytical and critical uses of design technologies. Um, as Nader mentioned, the position of the School of Architecture, together with the schools of engineering and arts, as well as the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, offers a unique opportunity for interaction, for interdisciplinary research and experience. And we're constantly working on expanding joint course offerings um, across the schools and the opportunities for collaboration and cross-pollination. Uh, this year we'll be further testing this idea of the interdisciplinarity of space through the construction of the ACE lab, which you'll hear more about a little later, as an extension of the workshop to include new opportunities for exploration and fabrication in three dimensions, 
that engage all of our schools of thought. And the hope is that these new kinds of tools will open up new kinds of thinking, both within and between the disciplines. And also, I just want to say that we are a really small school, but we punch way above our fighting weights in terms of the faculty we engage with, the work that our students produce, the culture we foster, and the caliber of students we cultivate. So with all of that said, I can't wait to meet some of you in person, hopefully in April at the Admitted Students Day. But until then, uh, we will now hear remarks from the Associate Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, Nada Ayad, uh, who will be followed by an introduction of our facilities from our staff and our students. So thank you. Hello, I am Nada Ayad, Associate Dean of the Faculty of the Humanities and the Social Sciences here at the Cooper Union. The fields of the humanities and the social sciences in general teach us how to interrogate our positions in society and our ideas of time and space, to question how knowledge is produced, reproduced, and categorized, and to what effect. They teach us how to try to make sense of the ambiguities, the contradictions, and the multiplicities of the historical moment in which we live, and the context from which we come. For me, these discussions and frames of analysis are not confined to the classroom. At Cooper, there are always vibrant student-led initiatives born out of student needs. I have helped to shape and organize a few such efforts. The Decolonize Cooper Initiative, the Race and Climate Reading Group, and the Intersectional Justice Readings and Lecture Series. They're ongoing and they're sustained efforts to help students navigate a world that is very complex. These projects are open to anyone from the Cooper community. They were conceptualized collaboratively and decentered. They all privilege a deep commitment to equity, to mutual respect, and to cultivating ways of to productive engagement. It's an incredible honor for me to do this work with such inspired and inspiring students, and I hope to see you in the future. Hi, my name is Gara Maldonado, and I'm currently a third year in the School of Architecture. First off, let me tell you about the foundation building. This is where you will be spending most of your time as an architecture student. This building was founded in 1859 and marks the creation of everything that is Cooper Union. Today, it is recognized as a historical landmark in New York City. Fun fact, when it was built, it was actually one of the city's tallest buildings in Lower Manhattan. Located in the lower level is the Great Hall, which has been a center for social discourse ever since the opening of the institution. For example, the Right Makes Might speech that launched Abraham Lincoln's presidential campaign was delivered here. The Great Hall has also hosted many political debates and movements, such as the NAACP and the First Women's Suffrage Movement. This historically significant space never fails to get packed. As a student, you will be plugged into these public discussions year round. There are various times where I've gone out of the foundation building only to find a huge line going around the block for entrance to these events. One way that this will be helpful is that it will allow you to contextualize your work within the social fabric of the city. Important to also note is the Cooper Union Library. It was the first library that was open to the public in the city of New York. At the moment, the Cooper Union gives half tuition scholarship to each student admitted and additional financial aid depending on need. In terms of curriculum, the architecture students take their classes on the third and seventh floor of the building. As a student, you have more resources throughout the building. My colleagues will tell you more about these resources that are available. In addition, as a student, you will take humanities courses throughout your curriculum. You will be also be taking some classes in 41 Cooper, which is the newest addition to the campus across the street from the foundation building. Some of the classes you can attend here include humanities classes, engineering and math classes, and art electives. In a way, Cooper Union's campus is New York City, more specifically the East Village area, where there are so many things to do. There is constant energy just by being in the area. The amount of options you have for food, cultural and artistic events, make it difficult to be bored. I believe that regardless of the amazing education that we do get here in Cooper, the location only adds to it. Not only are you going to be studying architecture, but you're surrounded by it, and all this inspiration will guide you. Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm a second year architecture student, and I want to tell you about the end of your show, which is Cooper Union's annual exhibition of student work in the schools of art, architecture, and engineering. In the School of Architecture, each class coordinates with the professors to design a public display of outstanding models and drawings as a way of inviting the people of New York City into the Cooper Union. Our exhibition normally occupies the studio spaces in common areas of the School of Architecture, including the entire third floor, the lobby of the seventh floor, and the first floor colonnade. This past summer, because of the rising cases of COVID-19 in New York City, 
the School of Architecture reimagined the end of year show in order to make it virtually accessible. This collaborative project coordinated by the School of Architecture Archive assembled efforts from students, faculty, and staff in order to create a full-scale 3D model for the foundation building and each of the end of year shows curated exhibits. The month-long effort, which I was a part of, gathered, curated, modeled, and virtually installed the exhibition throughout the foundation building spaces and its immediate urban context. We used the digitization of the show as an opportunity to experiment with new ways of presenting student work while integrating videos and life-size models that take you through an immersive experience of not only the show, but the inclusive pedagogical angle by which the school tackles the adaptations and advancements prompted by history. Hi, my name is Jenya, and I'm a fifth year architecture student. In the same way that the digitization of the end of year show made Cooper Union more accessible to the general public, over 150 years ago, Peter Cooper made our school accessible to the public by opening New York City's first public reading room, our Cooper Union Library. The library offers many research tools conformed by a unique collection of digital resources and physical books, journals, magazines, archival documents, computers, and spaces for students to work and study. Our library is a part of a consortium of libraries that includes NYU and the New School, meaning that we have access to thousands of books in libraries all around New York City. In short, the library is a bottomless well of information that empowers Cooper students to research and investigate the world around them very much in keeping with Peter Cooper's vision that the Cooper Union is a place where access to information follow the ideals of free education to sustain a more equitable way to advance knowledge, enrich civic discourse, and inspire creativity and social justice. Hi, I'm Stephen Hillier, and I'm the director of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture Archive, and I'm also a 1990 graduate of the school. This office is responsible for the exhibitions and publications that are put forth by the school each year, we also serve as a resource to students and faculty. So in, in terms of exhibitions, we generally mount one to two exhibitions in the Houghton Gallery down the hall of the second floor of the foundation building. And then over the course of each semester, we generally make uh, three to four exhibitions in the third floor hallway gallery, which is right in the middle of the School of Architecture. As an archive, we have a number of collections. Uh, one of them, and the most substantive of them, is the Student Work Collection. That dates back to the 1930s, and essentially at the end of every academic year, we document faculty-selected student work, and we retain that. Uh, we're currently in the process of turning that into an online database, which is a project that will complete in two years. We also have an amazing collection of New York City postcards that's almost 4,000 strong that are available for students and faculty to research from. We have an amazing photography collection by travel photographs of a, an architect by the name of Stanley Prowler. We have a lantern slide collection, and we have an extensive blueprint collection of built works that students can use as resources when they work on analysis projects. You also have the ability to work with us uh, here in the archive, making exhibitions, making publications, working on our database project. And we really think of this as working with students as opposed to uh, students working for us. Uh, it's a very collaborative environment, and uh, we really enjoy working with people, and especially it's kind of a learning environment. We get to teach folks a little bit about exhibition and bookmaking, which I think can be very useful to young architects. So I look forward to meeting you and hope that you might think to come work with us. Hi, my name is Brandy Vasquez, and I'm a fifth-year architecture student. I really appreciate being able to take electives within the School of Architecture, as well as courses in the School of Art and Engineering that range in subjects from the technical and historical to the theoretical, because they help me understand and contextualize my work. As a fifth year, these courses and discussions sustain my thinking beyond just form, and this helps me understand that I can look through different lenses that are outside the discipline of architecture and nevertheless shape it. Another way that we get to delve into a greater context is through exhibitions. The archive curates several exhibitions and receptions throughout the academic year. Their installation in our hallways and galleries enter our day-to-day -day conversations. For example, Natalie Pfizer's hallway exhibition titled Tailoring formed help me explore new sets of drawing tools and templates that translates concepts outside of architecture and subjects like art, fashion, automotive, and aerospace. At the north end of the third floor hallway, we have a small lecture hall where our different lecture series allows us to engage with architects, artists, scholars, and thinkers from different fields about their practices. At the end of the day, that's how we learn the most, by speaking to and working alongside people from different backgrounds, interests, and expertise, regardless of the experience in architecture. My name is Ezekiel Benz. I'm a third year architecture student. Throughout my three years within the school, I've been continually intrigued by both specificity 
and the depth of, of interest that the faculty bring forth within their respective syllabi. Uh, despite this, I find that there remains enough breathing room for agonism and responding authentically to prompts and the teachings. My seminars, specifically a 5,000 year history with David Gersten and critical history with McKenna Makeka, illuminate the intricacies of the analysis studio as we explore histories and biases behind formalism. A lot of the work that we do as architecture students is to think through discussion, writing, and making. And I would say that's how we figure out our interest. Hi, my name is Aaron. I'm a third year architecture student. Our studio is an open plan and it's a very important feature of the School of Architecture. Because of the small size of the architecture program, I think being in one space, everybody really gets to know each other and learning becomes a process where ideas are circulate and exchange between all years. Instead of being sort of isolated and hierarchical if you stay in different rooms, each class is composed about like 25 students and we're 125 students as a whole. So the open plan really works for us because we're small. And then it also adds to the immediacy of learning with and from each other. Uh, this sounds kind of counterintuitive because you might think it's kind of distracting to sit with so many people around you, but actually having both the students and the faculty around helps me focus and be very productive. Each class year is grouped within an area in the open studio, but there's actually no physical barrier and separation between the classes. So interaction or visual learning becomes pretty easy because you can always just kind of look up and see what others are up to. I think the most valuable thing that Open Studio offers me is the culture of constant learning. Uh, we learn not only in classroom, but also in the nitty gritty, spontaneous moment when we are with each other all the time. Uh, it's quite inspiring to watch and engage with peers who are very supportive and very bright. Uh, I'd say we learn as much from each other as we learn from our faculty. I'm going to take you through the third floor lobby, which is, in a way, the heart of our School of Architecture's academic community. The lobby is a place where we have pinups, lectures, and social events, so the space is always full of activity. Photographs show the space as very pristine, but in reality, when the space is not set up for critiques, visiting lectures, or school-wide events, the lobby is often filled with students working on their drawings and models. The lobby is a space of interaction where many informal conversations prepare us for more formal presentations and reviews. Two of the biggest events that take place in the lobby are the Convocation and the End of Year Show, the two book ends of the academic year. Convocation, which kicks off every semester, is a moment where the entire School of Architecture, both faculty and students, gather in the lobby to discuss the upcoming semester. During convocation, deans announce projects, events, and news for the coming months, and professors share the ideas behind the classes they will teach. The end of year show, on the other hand, wraps up the academic year, whether through impromptu exchanges with faculty, fellow students, or a visiting lecture event, the architecture lobby exemplifies the exciting dynamics formed by the academic atmosphere of the Cooper Union. Hey everyone, my name is Didi, and I'm a third year student here at Cooper. And my name is Annabella. I'm a fourth year student, and we're going to talk to you about the shop and the rest of the fourth floor of the foundation building. The wood shop is on the fourth floor of the Cooper Union Foundation building, which is sandwiched right in between the third floor architecture studios and the fifth floor art studios. It was strategically placed here to become the meeting point between two disciplines with the same goal of creating something physical. We create these physical objects using wood, metal, casting, and other materials. The fourth floor holds a wood shop, metal shop, and a plaster room, which combine into the shop. The shop is one of the biggest in New York City and is equipped with any tools you may need to build something at any scale. This space is an integral part of our learning and the School of Architecture's culture. Before I transferred to Cooper, I was studying linguistics and environmental studies at another school. So if you're anything like how I was when I first came here, then the shop might seem like an intimidating space filled with unfamiliar tools. But hopefully you'll realize how great of a space it can be for both building and for thinking. In our first year at Cooper, we all take a course called Shop Techniques in which we learn about the different machines, tools, and develop a skill set to help us stay safe while taking advantage of the many capabilities of the shop. The course is mandatory and is taught by the shop technicians whose collective fabrication knowledge becomes our go-to anytime we have a question on how to build a project. That project might be a chair, it might be a one-eighth model of a Corbusier building, it might even be a pair of small metal dice. Everything is on the table. 
All this to say, the shop and the hands-on process of model making is critical to our education at Cooper. The concepts we develop in the classroom and in the studio take physical form in the shop. This is done through our use of its mechanical tools, the skills we develop with the time and the help of the shop techs. Likewise, the digital fabrication allows us another way of producing and informing our work, and the School of Architecture dedicates projects, courses, seminars, and workshops to develop, contextualize, and advance our grasp on what these tools can afford us. The Ace Lab is the newest addition to our repertoire of tools and resources to model, fabricate, and perfect anything we need to design in the studio. At Cooper, we learn primarily from our peers due to the tight-knit community of the school. The shop is a place where we learn skills and ideas from each other in the architecture school as well as the art school. This extension of the studio is a place where we build and let our work speak to us and each other. Hello, uh, my name is Harrison Tyler and I'm the director of the ACE Lab. The ACE Lab is the Art, Architecture, Construction, and Engineering Lab, which is a brand new advanced fabrication resource for the Cooper Union. So starting, we have this machine. It uses water mixed with abrasive to cut through literally any material that you can think of. This machine is a CNC embroidery machine. So it's basically a computer-controlled sewing machine with 16 different needles, which means you can digitally embroider to those 16 different colors all simultaneously. This is our metal cutting laser cutter to cut through any type of metal, so aluminum, steel, stainless steel. Another cool feature is it can also cut a tube and pipe. So if you have you know, round or square material, it'll actually rotate it. You can create really complex, super clean joint arrangement. This machine is our full color gypsum 3D printer. So it prints with a, with a white plastery material and then it follows the 3D print with an inkjet cartridge and it can give you full color 3D prints. Okay, so this is our, our regular laser cutting section. Um, you can't cut metals over here, but just about any other material that these machines are capable of cutting, like acrylics, woods, papers, um, any of those can be cut on these machines. This machine is a vacuum forming machine, and then these are some examples of some, some things that we did. Or even more precise molded elements like this, which could be used to you know, create larger structures. Now, this is the main 3D printing section. Up at the top, we have eight Form Labs Form 3D printers. It prints very precise objects out of a variety of liquid resin materials. Down here, we have our Ultimaker 3D printers. Um, these create slightly lower resolution, but stronger parts, and it can print parts much more quickly than these. This lab and the technologies within it are actually very conducive for um, remote fabrication and remote learning. So while that's been a great asset for students, hopefully by the time you all are students, um, we'll be able to come in and use all this stuff in person, learn how it all works, um, use it to make all kinds of cool stuff. Hello, welcome to the Digital Architecture Studio. My name is Margaret Long and I direct this space, which is comprised of a production area um, where we do large format printing, large format scanning, um, and a computer lab where students work um, together until all hours of the night. This is An, she's a student worker, one of the great resources that we have um, as a lab space is that I work with up to 20 student workers. And this is where students spend a lot of time doing large format printing on our Epson printers, printing out um, large format prints. We print on many different types of materials, vellum, matte film, uh, transparency, and regular matte papers. All of that is available for students, and printing it for is free. The Digital Architecture Studio also has a range of 3D printing resources. We have um, stereolithography printers, these kind of DIY quickie print um, reality printers, and we have some MakerBot printers as well. We also have camera equipment and lighting available for checkout to architecture students. I hope this has been helpful and you're getting a, a better understanding of what would be available to you as an architecture student at Cooper Union. Good luck in your process. Hello, I'm Kit Nichols, director of the Center for Writing. The center is where you can get one-on-one -on -one help from professionals whose focus is entirely on your ideas, how you develop them in language, and how you communicate them clearly to others. We offer one-time sessions you can book online if you just need an hour to go over a draft of a paper, but most of our students prefer ongoing sessions, which give you the opportunity to see one of our writing associates every week at the same time. 
In ongoing sessions, you build an intellectual relationship with one of our staff who will ask you tough questions about your thinking and help you build a writing practice, a writing practice that will sustain you not just in your coursework at Cooper, but for the rest of your life. Why is a writing practice important for architects? Well, your design work necessarily moves among drawing, note-taking, live critiques with your peers and professors, and revisions. Building a design process that works for you will take serious language skills because new ideas are born partly from, a, from an abstract conceptual vocabulary you develop and then realize in drawings and structures. Why is a writing practice important in life, whether you're an architect or not? Well, because we all need ways to slow down and look more carefully at the evidence of our everyday lives so we can figure out what we really think, away from the noise of social media, entertainment, and obligations. We really hope we'll have a chance to work with you. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Benjamin Aranda, who will kick off the student and faculty panel. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? My name is Benjamin Aranda. And right now we're going to have a little conversation with uh, some faculty here and some students and give you a little, um, a little flavor of the kind of discourse that we have here at Cooper Union. Uh, I teach design studios. Uh, I, Recently, I am teaching a uh, first year uh, design, design one architectonics with uh, Ted Babb, who you're hearing from on this, uh, on this panel, and with Marcia Veladar, who you will hear from on a subsequent panel. Uh, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And I also teach um, uh, some uh, more advanced studios. Um, a lot of work I do is more in the interdisciplinary realm, where uh, I teach with uh, professors of engineering uh, to a uh, students of architecture and engineering uh, together in seminars and studio environments. So the idea is to uh, really produce an environment of, uh, let's say, a collaborative framework where people from design architecture can collaborate with um, with engineers on issues like uh, machine learning, uh, facial recognition, uh, contemporary. Um, contemporary issues that uh, really affect how we perceive uh, space, uh, issues of privacy and, and equity. So um, that's a very uh, short introduction about, um, about myself. Um, we have uh, here uh, Lorena Del Rio, uh, Tamar Zinger, Elizabeth O'Donnell, Austin Wade Smith and Ted Babb who are going to talk about uh, some of their work here at Cooper Union. And afterwards, we're going to hear from a group of students and then have a little conversation. So uh, first up, uh, Lorena. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Benjamin. It's a, a pleasure being here with all of you. Um, I joined Cooper Union uh, in 2017. So this is my fourth academic year. And in this time, I've been teaching uh, design studios, especially design four, design two, um, also design three. And also I'm teaching currently a really interesting interdisciplinary course uh, with engineer professors to participate at the Solar Decathlon competition. Um, Cooper is such an incredible place and I'm really happy to, to be part of this big, big family. Great, thank you, Lorena. Tamar, are you available? I am here, hi. Hi. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our open house. It's a pleasure for me to uh, see you. And um, I joined Cooper Union as a student many years ago, and I have experienced Cooper in different phases. And um, I have to tell you that there are many similarities to the way Cooper has functioned ever since I uh, was here a student in the 1980s. And, um, and wonderful people, wonderful students, wonderful faculty. And I think one thing that is characteristic of Cooper students is their, their excitement uh, to be together and to learn. And what is uh, shared by all the faculty is really the excitement to teach. And I have had the privilege to have colleagues from a variety of fields and um, 
and uh, different ways of talking about architecture. While I did graduate and practice for a while, I became a writer myself and uh, I'm writing history and theory of architecture. And uh, I also teach a variety of courses from history and theory of architecture to design. And I think that is what you will see at Cooper that uh, people cross a variety of fields and we all uh, meet together. It's a very nice to meet you and I hope to see you in the fall. Thanks, Tamar. Uh, next up, we're gonna hear from Elizabeth O'Donnell. You're on mute, Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, hi, thank you, Ben. Um, uh, an incredible pleasure to be here and an incredible pleasure to follow that amazing introduction to New York City, the foundation building, to see our students speak about their, sp their experiences here at Cooper, uh, and for you to meet some of the extraordinary staff that supports our work. Uh, at school, both us as faculty and you guys as, as students uh, in the process of making and inventing new architectures. Uh, so uh, my role is that I'm currently teaching um, structures from an architecture point of view of the uh, first of a, a series of seven structures classes. Uh, I have also taught um, in the design studios most recently in spring semester with Professor Del Rio um, at Cooper, we team teach, uh, which is uh, really an extraordinary model of bringing different points of view together on one teaching team. Um, uh, and I have, and last summer I also worked with my colleagues and with the associate dean uh, on the anti-racist task force, where as thinkers, as scholars, as citizens, as architects, we really try to investigate what it means to create an anti-racist learning environment. Um, so extraordinary work, uh, extraordinary opportunities that I think we bring to students. And uh, currently in my own work, I, uh, I'm spending a lot of time in the Hudson Valley uh, outside of New York City where I advise nonprofits and also I'm on public commissions that are investigating zoning issues and um, uh, the issues of development and climate change as they affect rural communities. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Austin Wade Smith. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, great to see all of your faces and really happy to be here. My name is Austin Wade Smith, um, and I teach courses in the architecture and in the engineering department here at Cooper, um, including the shop techniques required course on digital fabrication. <clears throat> Most of my research is focused on the critical perspectives and practices on technology's relationship to ecology and culture. Um, in addition to teaching courses, I also help coordinate resources in the curriculum um, within the broader school and within the department for the ACE lab um, and uh, allowing that to be a space of intersection, interaction, cross-disciplinary conversation within the school. Um, in addition to the kind of technical aspects of what I contribute, I think that a lot of what I do at Cooper is to nurture the culture of, of, of craft and critical understanding of materiality and fabrication not just from instructors to students, but how students propagate that attitude and that culture amongst themselves. And uh, that's something that the students carry um, on and many of the faculty just help nurture when they can. I'm happy to be here. Great, thanks Austin. And last but not least, Ted, Ted Bob. Hi there, uh, my name is Ted Bob. Um, I am currently teaching first year design studio, um, as Ben mentioned, along with Ben and Marcia, who are here today. Um, uh, over the last couple of years, I have also been teaching the uh, geometry and representation class, um, along with uh, Jimmy Ladder as well. So um, uh, my focus at Cooper has been uh, in particular on uh, first year. Uh, and what's exciting about that for me is really 
thinking about and trying to set up design problems that are about the kind of introduction to um, architecture as a discipline, but also as a kind of game and as a, um, a, as a, as a kind of um, exploration on its own. Um, I think I would uh, especially echo Elizabeth O'Donnell's um, uh, focus on Cooper as being special for the team teaching. And one of the most exciting parts that um, I found from teaching here is getting to work with so many different faculty and with those groups coming up with different ways of designing the studio and designing um, the problem that we work on together. It, it, it makes it kind of um, new every time you do it. And that's been super exciting for me. So very excited to see all of you and um, hope to see you in next semester. Thanks, Ted. Uh, so now we're going to hear from directly from some students. Um, I ask that uh, they introduce themselves and we're gonna start with uh, Sanjana. Hi everyone, my name is Sanjana and I'm a fourth year student at the School of Architecture. Uh, I'm from Singapore while I'm currently in New York City. Um, so one of the main things I've been involved in at Cooper is the student lecture series, which is a committee of architecture students that curates a series of guest lectures for the student body based on the various interests of the student body. And some of the themes that we're engaging with this year through our lectures are climate decolonization and labor, and there are many intersections with architecture. Um, and I think the series is a really good example of student-driven dialogue at Cooper, in which students have the agency to decide on the topics and types of conversations that happen within the institution uh, alongside the conversations created in design studios. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Sarah, you're next. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a third year here at uh, Cooper. Um, and I just wanted to bring light to the representation courses, which um, act like as a core for the first two years you're here. Um, they're kind of a new, uh, a, a new a new set of classes that we're taking. Um, and they consist of freehand drawing, descriptive geometry, photography, rendering, and uh, a type of analysis that's like always, they're always like uh, evolving under like student critique and stuff like that. Um, and they present, you know, the question of how do we address modes of representation and how do we, you know, push beyond, um, you know, uh, the standard modes and re we represent our work in studio and other classes in a new light. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Leslie, you're next. Hi, my name is Leslie Fruz, um, and I'm a first year student. Um, I'm part of, I'm a member of Cooper's Just Starting NOMIS chapter. Um, and uh, NOMIS start, stands for um, National Organization for Minority Architecture Students. Um, our goal is to create a community um, or safe space for Cooper students. And so far we've been doing casual get togethers over Zoom. We talk about each other's work or how life is going. Um, and sometimes we do student led critiques. Um, I'm also um, living in the dorms right now and just getting adjusted to Cooper. Thank you, Leslie Peruz. Uh, next up is JC. Hi guys, um, I'm JC. Um, I'm a, currently a thesis student. Um, I was also actually a transfer uh, coming into Cooper, having studied uh, what I thought I was gonna do was be a, in medicine, but that didn't really pan out. Um, but anyway, uh, so my thesis here at Cooper is sort of an opportunity for students to explore the subjects and ideas that they may have been cooking up throughout their four or five years while attending. My current thesis right now explores mundaneity and the everyday, as well as how we pay attention to our everyday surroundings. Thank you, Dr. JC. Uh, <laughs> next up, next up, Austin. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Austin. I'm in the graduate program, and um, I think there'll be like a separate panel. I think where we can maybe go into that a little bit more. But uh, I thought I'd just share that. I've, I think I've actually been in class with almost all the other student representatives um, through like the, the graduate electives. So that's just a really great way to, uh, again, like meet everyone and then um, like share 
classes. I guess it helps for us, we get to see we have more classes, but then also uh, we get to engage with everyone like the undergraduate. Uh, thanks, Austin. Well, now we're gonna open up uh, the discussion to, uh, uh, to everyone here, to the 10 of us, um, 11, I guess, if you include myself. Uh, and maybe um, Austin and JC, maybe if we can, since you're the most recent ones we've heard with, maybe can you both talk about what uh, the thesis year is, has been like at Cooper and, and how it's a, it's a unique culture at Cooper? I'll let Austin go first. Sure, yeah, totally. Um, so this is, yeah, it's a thesis semester for graduate. Um, actually, Ben is my advisor. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know who's moderating this, but um, and so um, it's, it's a great opportunity to like, I guess like reflect and kind of summarize what you're, you're passionate about. And um, for us, it's, kind of, it's like the, it's the final semester of our um, like year long program. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, we're kind of gearing up to, to finish, I think towards, you know, December or maybe January, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, regardless of the circumstances, I think it's an exciting situation because it really is an opportunity to sort of let out sort of all the things you've been uh, thinking about the past four years, uh, especially as an undergrad student, you sort of get to explore all these different facets within the seminars or through the um, other other classes you take. And thesis year really lets you delve into those interests at you know, full speed. So I think that that's, you know, I've been locked up in the, the basement office we have down here, like working away and it, you know, still feeling pretty good. <laughs> uh, great, thanks a lot. Um, maybe just uh, quickly switching over to another, um, let's say important part of the school culture here, which is uh, how Cooper deals with issues of representation. And by representation, I mean how, how ideas um, come, to, come to form in, uh, in, in drawing and model making um, uh, in the computer. Uh, maybe Sarah and, uh, and Ted, Ted Bob, maybe could you talk about the project of representation at Cooper? Um, how you learn how to draw, um, whether by hand or in the computer and, and why it's unique at a place like Cooper? Or do you want to go first? It's fine. You should go first. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, representation is a particularly interesting problem to study because it would it would appear that it's quite simple to draw an idea you have. But one thing we learned very early in design school is that uh, the act of drawing is also a way of thinking, um, and in service of that, we try and explore as many different ways of drawing as we can. Um, uh, Sarah mentioned before that um, one of the maybe more erudite modes of representation um, that's part of the curriculum is descriptive geometry, which is um, one of the classes that I've been involved with. It's not on its own something that seems that useful as a, as a technique in a professional setting, but it's an incredibly um, important way to think about how to draw space and how to think through drawing. And uh, it's an example of uh, one of the many different types of techniques of architectural representation that come to be a way of finding your own interests and your own way of designing as well. And those are techniques that we um, not just learn as a kind of skill, but get folded into uh, the design problems in the design studio. Um, through different forms of model making, uh, through different materials. So it's really about exploring as many different uh, ways of thinking about design and understanding that each way that we learn to represent it is also a different way of thinking about it as well. And that's kind of the framework, especially for the early design um, representation classes. Yeah, and this question of how do you learn how to draw, I think, is answered by you fail a lot before you come up with a good <laughs> drawing. Um, it's uh, because of the studio, because you're so connected with every year, you see how like the fourth years are drawing and you're like, oh, I didn't think of that before. Or you see how your peers are making models and you're like, um, that's a very good technique. Or um, So you're learning from each other and you're learning from 
when you build a bad model or when you make a bad drawing, um, you get feedback. And sometimes like there's so much written richness and like the work that you that that doesn't make it to the end. Um, you know, so I think it's a constant process of trying something new, seeing where it takes you and what you can emit, um, and then keep going. Great. Uh, thank you. That was that was great. Um, Maya, do we have time for another? Uh, yes, I think we can go to 11 um, oh, and then okay. I'll just give a five minute presentation. Okay, great. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that leads us to the next, um, maybe more uh, broader questions I had about the studio culture at Cooper and really how we have managed the transition to, um, to a hybrid model and to moving a lot of what was initially physical in our in our teaching to online environments. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, while this, as as uh, Dean Tarani mentioned, uh, you know, this uh, this is not a permanent state of affairs for us, but we have learned uh, some valuable um, some valuable things uh, through this process. And I'm wondering, Lorena, and uh, and maybe uh, a student. Uh, like Sanjana, uh, who has experienced both um, uh, both online and offline. Um, I'm wondering if you can both talk about um, how how we have made this transition and how uh, how it's reflected on our on our studio culture at at Cooper. Yeah, absolutely. I think it has been at the very beginning something really. Um, challenging for all of us, uh, especially because uh, it took us kind of like without being ready for, for that or without even thinking that that could happen. But I have, I have to say that it has happened in a very natural way and that the culture of our studio with the, uh, with the co-teaching model as uh, Professor O'Donnell mentioned before and th working with the class as a group and not individual sections of 10 students have helped a lot in that process. And I think that we've been trying to emphasize, and especially in this uh, second semester that we are dealing with this situation, to emphasize the, the collective work, the teamwork, uh, in order to, to keep that spirit of, um, of uh, community that we always have at Cooper. It's true that we all miss like um, running through the, through the corridors and seeing the work that everybody's doing. Uh, but we are like finding our mechanisms to, to feel that somehow we still belong to a great uh, studio culture that even if it's not in a physical space, it's in a uh, digital space and we can connect to Pritz, we can see uh, the work through other uh, medium and, and we still feel that, that sense of community. And yeah, combining different platforms, Zoom, Miro, uh, MeWe, like we, we all, Get, um, became experts in a lot of different softwares and, and platforms that we didn't even know before March, probably. And, and I have to say that uh, it has been quite natural, the, the process. And I feel super connected to my current students and to the students from last semester. Great. Yeah, and just to build off of that, I think um, even though we are in virtual space and we aren't able to make as many physical models or physical drawings as we were in the past, like the core values um, that we build on in Cooper um, have remained the same. So things like working with intention and rigor and care um, throughout our work and constantly iterating um, based on critique and feedback um, have been like a common thread that have really helped us keep the studio culture alive even in virtual space. Um, and I guess one of the unexpected perks um, of being in virtual space is that we're able to invite guest critics um, from outside the country and outside the school that may have otherwise not been able to um, see your work, um, as well as um, having different students from uh, other schools um, also be present at our critiques. Great. Um, thank you, Sanjana. Uh, maybe we can talk, um, you know, specifically about um, the kinds of making that happen uh, at Cooper and, and specifically things that are uh, quite unique here. Um, I'd like to ask Austin Wade Smith to uh, maybe talk about the problem of uh, building one-to-one uh, -one or, or building things uh, in situ. 
uh, installations, uh, so forth. I mean, you talked about um, the kind of uh, fostering a, a, um, a community of, of, of making or craft at Cooper. Um, can you talk about some of your projects and what you've, uh, what you've tried to accomplish? Um, sure. I, I really appreciated the comment early on that, that said that like the entirety of New York City is the, is the classroom of Cooper Union. And I think that one of the most um, compelling and interesting ways with which that happens is through the culture of fabrication. Um, fabrication has a really rich culture uh, and history at Cooper Union that I'm sure is not uh, news to anyone here. Um, and part of our own growth and, and evolution of the school is to like critically consider how digital tools fit within that lineage and are not just something novel and brand new, but are in fact part of much longer continuity of cultures and methods of making, or as Ted described, thinking through the drawing, thinking through the craft of producing things. So some of the interesting things that digital fabrication at Cooper allows us to do is to build big things, one-to-one -one scale things, which operate less as uh, models or modes of representation, but are in fact prototypes. Um, they do what they intend to do. And because we're smack dab in the middle of New York City, um, this entire arena of life and all the drama that plays out um, uh, is happening surrounding the school. And so the, some of the really interesting work that, that is on the horizon in the past and also in the future is exploring ways of directly participating and intervening in the city itself through fabrication projects. Um, and those can take a, a wide range of different forms. Um, but one of the interesting things I think about that is that uh, you know, the projects of one-to-one -one prototyping participating in the city is something where, yes, there is a culture of review and critique with which we could discuss your projects, but the city itself is gonna give you more feedback than you could ever imagine if it's actually out in the world. And so the culture of producing something and participating in the city and then letting the world give you feedback of whether or not your project actually stands up. Does it stand the test of time? Do people, how do people interact with it? How does it change different dynamics within the city? And you can look at it in context and learn from it. Um, and I think that's a, a big part of what we try to nurture in the culture of prototyping and um, using the opportunities of where we are in the city um, to get a, get a kind of feedback that otherwise is very difficult to get within an educational model. Uh, thanks, Austin. Um, that was great. Uh, well, we just have time for, well, do we have time for, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from Elizabeth O'Donnell and, and, and Tamar. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, great. So, uh, well, very quickly, um, uh, Elizabeth and Tamar, I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, opportunities for inter interdisciplinary learning at, at, at Cooper um, in your experience. Um, uh, and uh, maybe uh, specifically to, uh, to Elizabeth, um, you know, we are launching this uh, ACE lab, uh, which is contributing to all our pedagogies uh, in some way. I wonder if you could just qu quickly talk about the ACE lab and, uh, and, and Tamar uh, after Elizabeth, if you could, if you could expand on, um, on uh, specifically on interdisciplinary learning or um, uh, really some of your own interests in, in your classes at, uh, at, at Cooper. Um, shall I start? Sure, yes yeah. please. Um, so thanks Ben, thanks for the question. And so maybe I'll confess something. Um, uh, the students may understand that with the pandemic, most of us are teaching virtually uh, and not going into the foundation building. So it was my first introduction to what the ACE lab is gonna be and do. So the first thing I had to do was to send an email to Austin saying they have digital sewing machines and embroidery machines. Like we have to make a class about this. <laughs> yeah. And so I think, I think one of the things that becomes exceptional about the ACE lab is to recognize that it really extends Cooper's recognition of um, how technologies are always evolving. And, you know, Nader, I think, spoke beautifully about how our pedagogy, our curriculum is always evolving because of the need, the cultural needs that emerge, because of the knowledge of the discipline. That means that we also need to take the, the capabilities, the technological capabilities of making and allow them to evolve as well. 
uh, and that it's a two way street. Somebody's building the machine because they saw a need that has been expressed by people who make things, but then having been made, that machine will then inspire uh, and move people to invent the thing, new things that can be done with that machine. And I think one of the things our students have always been so great at doing is extending the capabilities, the, the thinking capabilities of the technologies that they employ, be it how far you can go with a plaster cast, what you can do with a table saw that nobody else ever figured out how to do with a table saw. And now we will have the opportunity to say, what can I do with that water jet that nobody has done yet? And you know, I think Cooper students are uniquely prepared to really take these new technologies and test them to the max. So it's the testing of the technologies that I think is going to be so, so interesting, so exciting, so much fun, so expansive in how we think about space. So great. That's what I would say. And, you, and I would just tag this on to the fact that Cooper now has the widest time frame of technological capabilities, I think, of any room in New York City. We have a forge. That means you can melt metal at, 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 on the fourth floor at Cooper Union. So we go back to the Bronze Age, and we will now be like 21st century ready to go forward into the future. Like amazing. Uh, that's great. Tamar, I'm wondering if we could just put the last, uh, have you finish off this, um, this really okay. exciting panel. So on the one hand, I want to say that being a student of architecture at Cooper, you're part of a very small group of students who goes together through all the studio classes and you have best friends that become best friends, remain best friends for life and some of the best counselors you have on your own work. Uh, at the same time, we offer seminars that really attract engineers and artists also. Uh, in my own work, I look at aspects of play and the pedagogy of design across scales and um, across time. And in uh, some of my seminars, I've had students design architectural toys, for example. And, and this project has attracted students from art and from engineering and, and not only in my seminar, but in others as well. I think the fact that you get to meet artists and you need engineers really uh, as a, a expansive effect on your way of learning. So um, I think this is something that happens and not only among artists and engineers, but also with the community. I know that some uh, classes do meet with um, other groups and other um, uh, do events in Manhattan in, in that one of the play seminars, we invited actually students, children from middle schools to play with those toys that the architects designed. And I think this was a great learning experience for the students. So um, I think the aspects of interdisciplinary learning also uh, happens uh, on a variety of uh, scales and levels at Cooper and in the architecture specifically. Great, thanks Tamar. Yeah, I, I, I can uh, fully um, relate to the benefits of interdisciplinary uh, uh, teaching. It's, um, uh, and the students seem to uh, respond um, uh, to being in the classroom with, um, with, their, uh, with their counterparts in art and engineering. Well, that's, that's the time that we have. Um, I hope you got to, um, get a sense of uh, the students and the uh, some of the instructors here uh, on 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 some of these issues and uh, uh, thank you uh, thanks for letting me uh, moderate this and we'll take it back to you Mai. Thank you so much. Um, I think that was really informative and exciting. Um, so thanks to all the presenters. Um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of some practical details like the application process. Um, and then we are going to break into two sessions, the undergraduate session and the graduate one. The undergraduate session will stay in here and um, the graduate will move to a new Zoom link, which is in the emails and also put it in the chat when it's time. Um, but 
first, I will go over the application process. Let me just share my screen. Um, so for undergraduate applicants, um, the first step to apply to Cooper is uh, the common application, which you've probably heard of by now, but it's basically just putting in all of your um, basic information, um, you know, your activities, your GPA, where you're from. Um, then we also need your transcripts, letters of recommendation. Um, it's important to note that for the next two years, the SAT and ACT testing is optional. Um, and that means that it's really optional. You do not need to send it if you don't want to. Um, it's really up to you whether or not you send it. Um, we have an application fee of $75. If English is not your main language and you haven't had three years of English instruction, then you will need to submit a language proficiency test as well. Um, I just realized I forgot to introduce myself, but my name is Maya Kurdic. I'm um, the assistant director for admissions for architecture, and I'm a graduate of the School of Architecture myself. Um, and so the second step of your application is the studio test, which is unique to Cooper. And I'll go over here. Um, the studio test is definitely makes up a large part of your application to Cooper. Um, it is six to eight visual projects that are designed by the faculty um, and you have about four weeks to complete them. And it's really just a way for you to express your creative, conceptual, visual thinking to the committee. Um, the, it's important to note the committee is not a group of admissions officers, it's actually faculty and students. So the people who will be teaching you and working alongside you will also be reviewing your work. Um, and this is really where you enter into your first conversation with Cooper. Um, it's called a test, but I think you should really just think of it as, um, you know, something, a fun project um, that will sort of let you know if the pedagogy at Cooper is sort of a good fit for you. Um, if you enjoy doing the test, I think you would enjoy the education at Cooper. Um, the instructions will be emailed to you after you after the Common App deadlines, and then it will be returned by mail, though this year I think we'll change it to digital submission because of the restrictions of the pandemic. Um, we don't accept portfolios from first year applicants, um, only from transfer applicants and graduate applicants. Um, the studio test that in that way is sort of a levels the playing ground so that you know, it's not about previous work, it's about sort of responding to the prompts in front of you. Um, the application process for graduate students is the Master of Science and Architecture application, which is, you know, the basic application form where you fill out all of your information and background. Um, we need transcripts from you, letters of recommendation, resume, CV, a personal statement, um, samples of writing, which could be like your thesis writings, um, any articles you've written, essays you've written, um, and then a portfolio, which is digital this year as well. Um, and that can be uploaded into the application. Um, also an application fee of $75 and then also an English profici proficiency exam if needed. Um, the timelines, these are all on our website, but just so you understand the, we have early decision, which is binding. If you know Cooper is your number one choice and you definitely wanna come here if you get in, then you can apply early decision. Um, and then our regular decision deadline is January 5th, um, as well as the graduate deadline, which is January 5th. Um, the studio test is emailed a week after those deadlines. So make sure to get in all of your materials before that deadline, and then you'll get the test a week later, and then you'll have to send it back a week, a month after that. Um, just a practical detail. Everyone always asks if we have housing. Um, we do have one dorm that's reserved for first year students. Um, and in this diagram, you can see the tall brown building is just across the street from our academic buildings. And these are um, apartment style residencies reserved for first year students. Um, it's not guaranteed, but if you're a first year student, you're typically always um, able to get a place in the dorms if you need. Um, it's a good way to transition from living at home to New York City. Um, and then after that, you learn how to sign a lease, live in New York City, live with roommates. Um, so coming to Cooper is also learning a lot of really important life skills um, that will serve you well. Um, we also have no meal plan, which everyone always asks, but we are in the East Village, which is an amazing place for all different types of cuisines. So, um, and then also the dorms have an apartment um, a kitchen, so you can also cook at home. Financial aid, um, all admitted undergraduate students 
receive a half tuition scholarship, which is valued at $22,275 for the duration of the five-year program. Um, exceptional candidates might receive additional merit award, which you don't have to apply extra for. Um, and then also you should make sure to fill out FAFSA if you're a domestic applicant um, before you submit your application um, so that you can get any sort of financial um, aid when you're admitted or if you're admitted. Um, we also have lots of work study opportunities on campus. Okay. Maya already said this, I want to bring emphasis uh, to the home test that despite the fact that it's called a test, uh, it is anything but. Uh, in, in fact, uh, it is a series of riddles. Uh, it, it, it's about play. Uh, it's about uh, showing your engagement and passion and uh, uh, confrontation with uh, these games that we put on your desk, uh, such that there are no right answers or wrong answers, but only uh, an opportunity to demonstrate creativity and engagement. I, I want to bring emphasis to that because so much of our admissions process is based on your initiatives and less so our critical input. So um, uh, um, one day we'll even change the name of that test, but uh, <laughs> for now, let that be. Yes. Um, thank you for that, Nader. Um, so now we are going to stay in this session for the undergraduate curriculum presentations and then also live Q&A, but the um, graduate students, would you please move to this Zoom session? Um, I just put it in the chat. Okay, so we're gonna have presentations on all five years of the curriculum from five different faculty members who teach those years. Um, and to start off with, we'll have Professor Mercia Veladar, um, who will present on Design One Architectonics. Thank you, Maya, for the kind introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be with you today. So as Maya pointed out, I will be presenting first year recent architectonic work that should give you a visual glimpse of what our students learn by the end of their first year at the Cooper Union. In terms of my own history, I should also highlight that I'm a proud alumni of the Cooper Union uh, and I have taught here since 2005 a variety of studios or courses that seem to often revolve in principles of experimentation and tectonics. Um, with that, I will share my screen and start the presentation. Uh, what is architectonics? This design course systematically exposes formal and spatial and structural experimentation and tectonic figurative formwork through a system of base six design elements where each studio phase is positioned as a spatial game. Through rigorous project testing and coordinated confluence of descriptive geometry, history, and theory, and freehand representation courses, these spatial categories are infused with scale and time as the iterative animators of tectonic forms. Separately or through combination, this is the fundamental vocabulary of our architecture. Learning through drawing. What you see on the screen right now is a typical example of a first semester uh, studio in first year and just the body of drawings our students are able to learn to create on their own by the end of those first three months. These projects also received the prestigious studio prize for top studio in North America recently. Part of what we do at the Cooper Union, we really make sure that you learn through a process of innovation and experimentation through the tools and techniques that challenge standard conventions in drawing and model making. Uh, we, we explore spatial novel prototypes through a variety of innovative techniques in drawing representations that challenge those conventions, giving agency to the set of tools and concepts introduced in the first year curriculum as translations between orthographic two-dimensional drawings known as plan sections elevations to three-dimensional drawing methods such as oblique projections, axonometrics, composite drawings, assembly aggregations, and animations, which we see here. These standard processes are reconfigured in your individual discovery of concept, space, and form. Learning how to use advanced digital and analog tools and techniques challenges you to use spatial iteration as a transformative design act. 
capturing the effects of time and formal figuration where precise constraints when written in syllabus are dared to create an environment of invention and play. These parameters are often tested through a sequence of real tectonic frameworks, revealing scale of the human body within a matrix of individual elements such as ramps, stairs, walls, and floors. Learning through construction. In addition to advancing drawings and scripts, physical models, constructions, reframe concepts by introducing gravity, material and geometric properties, and phenomenological qualities such as light and atmosphere where you begin to develop an intuitive understanding of the relationship between space and human behavior through parameters of physical construction and inhabitation. Precision, craft, and intentionality in model making will play a key role in understanding how material manipulations and geometric organization work in tandem to produce load resisting structures where we discover the power to span, load, cantilever, suspend, and balance, as well as what it means to shift things into a spatial disequilibrium. Moreover, we will investigate the multiple meanings of structure, both as literal structure, that which provides form and stability to resist external forces, but also as a way of structuring experience as a spatial framework that will be evaluated for its conceptual, organizational, and aesthetic potentials and the ways in which it produces a specific set of qualities and meanings for inhabitation. First year, the Cooper Union enables you to learn to take risks and to discover new forms and logics through the joy of making in tandem with a sequence of workshops, distinguished guest lectures and glass critiques, which we saw earlier. Architectonics introduces a culture of spatial experimentation as an innovative design process where formal preconceptions are discarded and new ways of seeing and thinking about space and architecture is discovered. So what we see in the last slide is a typical example of what it's like to be in a studio and receive a critique. Here are a few examples of uh, concurrent representation drawing uh, mechanisms that our students learn as well. The first year curriculum is extremely robust in enabling each of our students to really learn and discover through these processes of experimentation, also the most contemporary, and I would say very advanced um, ways of challenging our current softwares and through specific techniques and tools. I think we're next to the last slide. That's it guys for first year. Thank you so much, Marcia, that was great. Um, so now we'll have Professor Stephanie Lin present on Design 2. All right. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie Lin, and I have been teaching Design 2 as well as Representation 3 in, in the fall of year two. Um, and this year, students continue their investigations from architectonics, um, including geometry and form, um, and also continue to incorporate further constraints of structures, materiality, context, and program as well as issues of historical precedent and representational media into their projects. Um, a way in which these subjects come together is shown in Last Spring Studio with Lorena Del Rio, um, experimenting with drawing movement and building kinetic prototypes that would inform the design of a research center for play. Students in year two have also engaged in rich design problems in structures one. And here I'm showing two collaborative installations uh, led by Julian Palacio. And these installations can be seen from two different standpoints, one that is massive and one that is ephemeral. Both examine the intricacies of equilibrium at a one-to-one -one scale. And these were built by the, the class as a group effort. Um, so for the fall semester of Design 2, um, which I'm currently teaching with Nima Javidi, the coordinator, and Julian Palacio, um, the students have been engaging in a framework surrounding the interaction of architectural form, type, and ritual through the compositional techniques of collage, montage, and exquisite corpse. Type is related to the to the typical and generally refers to objects of the same formal structure, such as a basilica or temple, 
both of which can be found in this matrix. This also becomes the source material uh, to be operated upon um, in this fall studio. This year, the first act or exercise um, um, began by overlaying a collective ritual onto uh, plans and sections, each belonging to a type um, and transforming those through collage. So this is an exploration of the relationships between type and program through the lens of transformation. And this is done through a series of operations such as the splitting and rotating of fragments that would become instruments in exploring degrees of spatial and geometric autonomy, as well as the interdependence between parts. So students develop a way of producing variations on type, um, addressing the internal and external constraints of transformation, resulting in pairings of plans and sections that may not have an obvious relationship to each other initially. Um, but this is also an important site of imagination in which one must invent an interpretation of the three-dimensional space that relates the two cuts, finding clues within the drawings that, um, that hint at shared properties as well as a spatial language that would unite them. So this is the first level of hybrid that occurs in the studio. And as you can see in these works from last year, the outcomes retain both the property of collage as well as the legibility of their source material, the type. Um, they then gain a tectonic logic through the lens of structural montage, attempting to resolve the, the seams that create continuity and rupture. And the collage is put through the test of structural systems and their behavior, um, as well as physical modeling. The, um, the final project becomes an assembly and merging of three transformed types together, once again, finding new relationships um, between parts at a larger scale and combining multiple buildings into one. We introduce the contingencies of context as well as a more robust program. Last year, this program was a community kitchen, dining hall and greenhouse. And this year, the students will be creating a multi-faith center in the East Village. So a, a, productive, a productive tension between space and its function is at play including questions of how architecture can embody cultural values through its own organization, while at the same time accepting and embracing that other values can be enacted within any organization. Developing an adeptness with form and its combinations is crucial to understanding and suggesting these relationships and to create new meanings within that framework. So um, just ending with a couple of shots from the virtual end of year shows, showing the, the range of works that have been produced through year two, um, as well as a group photo from last fall. And we definitely had a lot of fun and it has continued this year as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. That's really fun to see the Zoom grid. <laughs> Um, so now, Professor James Lauder will present on Design 3. Okay, so hi, my name is James Lauder. Uh, I've been teaching here at the Cooper Union, it seems like now forever, uh, 10 years. Um, and I teach uh, Design 3 in the fall, which is the analysis studio, as well as the representation sequence in first year. Um, and so the fall, the first semester of third year is what we call analysis where we basically look at a set of what we call canonical buildings uh, and analyze them, uh, not just for like a couple of weeks or a month, but for the entirety of the semester. Um, even though this year is a slightly different um, organization, where we basically look at buildings really deeply as a uh, formal organization for the conceptual ideas for how the architecture comes together as a way, as a, Kind of structuring for ourselves to realize that looking in itself is a design act. Analysis is not just looking at something and um, revealing what's already there. But it's also coming to the table with a set of concepts and ideas and finding ways to uh, use representation, both drawing and model, to privilege certain ideas, concepts, readings of these buildings. And so, uh, this year and last year, we really focused on looking at a, a, a swath of both modern, what is called modern buildings and postmodern buildings. 
early 20th century and late 20th century to kind of see what types of um, problems, questions, uh, both social, cultural, political, as well as formal and spatial, uh, certain architects of certain generations uh, were preoccupied with. Um, and as a sort of way of, whoops. Sorry. Uh, as a way of kind of um, recognizing that not only is architecture uh, an appendage of culture at large, but also architecture as a body of knowledge has its own culture, All right? So, and again, uh, this is sort of, um, this is some great models. So again, like questions of like, you know, how does the, not only in terms of like craft, but also in terms of um, how do I distill something down to a set of just the key components or the key elements which construct an architectural idea? What are the things that which an architect uses uh, to uh, create a sort of idea about how does one create a sort of self, a cultural subject through an architecture? Um, this is part of the larger discussion. Uh, and so in addition to that, you know, uh, we're in tandem with the studio is uh, building technology classes where students look at it from a, the opposite end, right? Not architecture as a sort of conceptual um, uh, and formal organization uh, built of, you know, looking at form as notation. Here we look at form as really as a sort of assemblage of material, right? And so these so students are not only studying these same buildings and looking at them, how, uh, what materials are being used, but also really closely looking at the methods of fabrication and basically a building one-to-one -one or one-to-two scale um, mock-ups to kind of understand uh, what goes into making a building, right? So you can understand the techniques by which an architecture uh, is using uh, and disciplining matter. Uh, and then that's usually fo followed by um, a design problem, which basically is now using that sort of close looking and analysis and reversing that vector towards something that is, you know, a synthesis, right? And so uh, this is called the, the integrated building studio, which happens in the spring, um, which is basically looking at not only, a, um, in this case, it's housing, but how does now we, how do we design a building and make thematic in its work, uh, its urban placement, its aggregation of units and space, uh, what are its tectonics, what are its means and methods, what are its materials and construction systems. And so it's really kind of a place, this is like a sort of like one of the most uh, intense studios where you basically really kind of synthesize all these different things you've been learning from architectonics and second year and representation and structures and history and urbanism and really synthesize it into a sort of complete um, architectural project. Um, maybe one or two more slides. I think this is a housing studio from last year. Ooh, la, la. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, so now we'll have Professor Lorena uh, Del Rios to present Design 4. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to be talking about Design 4, um, but before that, um, trying to understand Design 4 within the context of the fourth year at Cooper Union, which is meant to be um, to broaden the study of our discipline, placing it within uh, its diverse urban and rural context, depending on advanced knowledge of technological, structural, and professional topics, and especially emphasizing the planning, zoning, social, and cultural implications of architectural interventions. So this time for uh, study the relation of institutional architecture to urban networks and infrastructures, public space and typologies from the investigation of rebuilding strategies following disasters to the role and nature of tall buildings and the nature of public and private institutions. So right now, Design for Studios are framed in a way that allows for advanced topics to be addressed in depth, benefiting from smaller groups and a more research-based setting. So in order to, uh, to give a couple of examples, I will share uh, what happened last fall in, in the design studio that I taught called Ruins in Reverse, Permanent Trace of Temporary Living, 
It was an intense course dealing with a very urgent matter, the migratory uh, trends and the social, political, and architectural consequences. So this image that belongs to the photographic series Hill of Shame from artist Gianni Cipriano captures the African-European migration crisis in April 2011. Italy, Greece, Spain, and Malta, being the main gateways, face the challenge of sheltering thousands of migrants coming irregularly, risking their lives and um, their uh, future in the Mediterranean Sea. The studio set the question, can architecture change the perception and impact of a problem that goes beyond its limits? In the design studio, our students investigated new forms of temporary co-living by exploring modular systems that could create new and diverse communitarian structures, restoring forgotten cultural identities and fighting inequalities. So the studio was meant to be a reflection on time and temporariness, designing backwards, starting by the future, that then led uh, in reverse to the present, based on the premise that the temporary dwelling on of the migrants would leave a scar, a footprint that would be the physical trace of their inhabitation. So in the first part of the semester, students had to analyze an existing ruin in order, in order to learn from the principles of vernacular architecture. For then, in the second part, uh, design the future ruin of their proposals for temporary living. Operating more at the scale of the landscape, and reflecting on the durability and impact of human interventions. The proposals should be a modular system compound by two parts, tectonically, tectonically different, uh, each of them serving different purposes, and uh, both of them permanent and temporary addressing different needs. The solid part of the system should be the structure and main spatial configurator, the core module that was already designed as the future ruin of the proposal. The temporary component was meant to make the structural cell livable, animating space, providing flexibility, and defining the ways of living. We worked in the framework of a specific site and context. The Italian island of Lampedusa, which is a small piece of land, part of the uh, Sicilian province, but located closer to the coast of Tunisia. Students operated in different scenarios. The present scenario, where the system serves as an emergency shelter for arriving migrants, and the future, where only the trace will remain, creating a new and improved landscape. Inspired by the work of Marcel Duchamp and his Green Box, and also influenced by the temporary and traveling condition of the topic, the students were asked to compile all the production of the semester into a box, a portable, dynamic, and interactive display of the whole process of the semester. So uh, this is the result of uh, eight proposals from eight different students, all of them dealing with the same topic, but responding in a myriad of ways. From transforming the ground as the base of, uh, for, the new, for a new infrastructure for the island, to thinking about the ruin as part of a productive landscape, to including solar energy, energy technology or designing a new water infrastructure for uh, the whole island. Investigating modular construction and also challenging the implantation on the island and inhabiting the ground. or barely touching the ground. So the final review was framed as an interactive gallery exhibition where the objects trigger several discussions among, among the jurors and the visitors, opening up the conversation to the whole school. And really, really quickly, I will run through the um, uh, current design for studio this fall semester that it's dealing with all the unprecedented events that uh, 2020 has brought us, the um, sanitary crisis that it's somehow questioning our essence, our ways of living and working and communicating, but also being aware that uh, other global scale problems require uh, multifaceted and cross-disciplinary systems of solutions. 
So we are trying to make this course uh, responsive to the set of urgencies that have been presented to us, dealing with uh, different parts that are interconnected, but building from each other, shifting from the urban scale uh, to the scale of the block, to the scale of the building, and to the scale of the domestic space. So uh, students have been dealing with uh, an interdisciplinary approach uh, in creating um, a cartography of a neighborhood in New York City, in the Bronx, trying to bring new expertise and diverse views to the practice and to address more efficiently global issues. The second part of the semester has been dedicated to uh, design strategies for urban regeneration. Uh, the third part is dedicated to improve the um, uh, building, uh, the, the sustainable development and the building performance of an existing building. And the last part is dedicated to rethink domestic space intervening in an existing building. And we know that we are not alone in this process, so we invited uh, taking advantage of this digital format, uh, many experts and um, uh, people who are like uh, who can bring their vision and expertise in these proposed topics. Fantastic. Thank you, Lorena. Um, this semester's studio sounds really exciting. Um, and last but not least is Professor Michael Young, who will walk us through thesis. And then after that, we'll open up the floor for Q&A um, with students and faculty. And um, you can go ahead and start writing your questions in the chat if you want to go ahead and do that. So hello, everybody. I'm Michael Young, and I'm teaching in the thesis year this year. Cool. Um, so the, the first four years you're at Cooper, you have a semester studio project, a semester studio theme in the fall and one in the spring. In your last year, you're asked to take it on for yourself. You're asked to set the agenda. You're asked to set the research, set the exploration, set the site, build the world in which you want to then begin thinking about, commenting on, and reflecting on the first four years of your experience at Cooper, what you have learned, uh, the questions you've asked, the things that have been explored in seminars, the things that have been explored in other courses within the School of Art and Engineering, and take them as a project of your own exploration. It is a design thesis. It is a thesis that is posing creative uh, innovation, creative um, acts, drawings, models, images, uh, fabrications, texts, as ways to understand new questions about the discipline, as ways to poke at the discipline. Um, quite often these become projects that are a summation of things you've been thinking, but just as often they become a, a launch pad, a way in which you begin to hold your views and present them to the world. They are a public discussion. They are a way of engaging culture outside of the school, but through the school, outside of the discipline, but through the discipline. Architecture is um, much more than simply a building. It is a building of worlds. It is a way of understanding our relationship to the world, a way of understanding how we as architects can imagine alternate possibilities for the ways in which the world can appear, can behave, and our roles as citizens within it. So you've been seeing a number of projects over the past several years that have ranged from buildings to bicycles, uh, from explorations of uh, representation, explorations of technology, explorations of fabrication. All of these are things that are available for you to pursue within your thesis. Uh, in your last year at Cooper. And to kind of bring this back to a moment, you've been seeing final projects. Right now we're in the fall semester. The fall semester of the thesis is a design semester as well, but a design semester in which you, as a student, build your world, build the issues, build the themes, build the things in which you are going to be engaged in for the rest of the uh, fifth year. So a few projects here from the fall. This is a project which is building the world of the airspace around an airport, that which is inhabited by the airplane as a three-dimensional spatial temporal uh, zone, which we do not see because we are inhabiting the ground, 
which is, which is just as physical, just as spatial, and just as dynamic as anything that happens within the terrestrial realm. Another thesis, which is looking at infrastructure, the infrastructure here of the uh, BQE, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, as it makes its way from South Brooklyn to the Brooklyn Bridge. And the fact that this infrastructure is in all ways, shapes and forms, kind of insanity of technology and construction and spatial relationships as cars and trains and bridges and tunnels and uh, excavations and cities are brought together for an experience which is just as urban as walking the street. Here's a project in which the site is negotiated in multiple forms. One form being the landscape, the pan, the other form being the machine which navigates that landscape. In this case, uh, the kind of high end extreme form of uh, racing, which is done through automobiles in very, very rugged remote sites. This is leading the student to explore the form and shape and uh, uh, let's say the car as a site, which is both in terms of its material fabrication and its formal properties, but also the ways in which the car builds sites, the car builds landscapes, the traces of the machines and the machinery we, that we mark the planet with begin to become new places, new forms of conceiving what a site is. Conceiving what a site is is in many ways about attention. How do we pay attention to our world? To what elements do we pay attention? How do those become pieces in which we as architects are able to intervene, are able to understand this, this place, this city, this environment in which we're involved in? And by paying close attention, often there are qualities, qualities just hovering beneath the surface that become places, uh, opportunities for us to interact with our environments. And for many of us, our environments are our bedrooms now, our apartments, our houses, our backyards. And so this student is pursuing an environment built into and out of the space of representation. You can see the false perspective of two window frames built into his bedroom, but you can also see his foot, which his foot in plan is there and his hand in plan is there, which means that his hand is reaching through his apartment from one spot to another to create a space, a site, a place in which representation can be explored as a thesis project. And this student happened to begin his exploration of the thesis with a film. So uh, thanking Peter Cooper for all the kinds of problems and opportunities and provocations that he's been able to explore, that we've all been able to explore, and you will be able to explore um, if you're uh, coming to join us. So welcome to the start of this process and look forward to talking with you about any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all. Um, that film looks great. Um, so now I'll have the students who are the current students who are present um, introduce themselves just so we have an idea of their name, where they're from, what year they're in, um, and then we can start. I'll read some of the questions from the chat um, and pose them to some of you. Um, and if you do want to verbalize your question, we also welcome that so you can raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, but we'll start with who are we starting with? Uh, Martina, could you start us off? Yeah, hi, I'm Martina. I'm from Mexico City. I'm currently in second year. Great. Um, MC. Hi, my name is MC Love. Um, I'm originally from Texas, but currently living in New York City and I'm in the second year. Cool. Um, Antonio. Hi, my name is Antonio Kalaka. I'm from South Florida and I'm a first year student. Welcome. <laughs> um, Layla. Hi, my name is Layla and I'm a second year and I'm from New Jersey. Great, and Gabriella. 
Hi, I'm Gabriella. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and I'm in my thesis here. Great. Um, I'm going to start us off with, is this a five-year architecture program? If it is, it is, a prof is, is it a professional track and can you sit for the license exam? Um, who would like to answer that? Michael, would you answer that one? Sure. Um, yes, it's a, a five-year professional program and thus it puts you into the situation um, in terms of your educational requirements to take the licensing exam um, after you've graduated. Now, there are other things that come into um, requirements in terms of uh, what you need to do to take the licensing exam, and those are intern hours and experience within offices, uh, and that's regardless of uh, meeting the educational requirements. But uh, as far as your question, yes, after five years, you have a professional degree, a Bachelor of Architecture, and um, that component of your requirement is fulfilled. Thank you. Um, maybe Merciha and Jimmy, you could speak to what do you look for in a potential student? What is the most important? <laughs> what? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, in general, you should always be yourself. Obviously, as the Tehrani said, the, you know, these that are so-called home tests, it's a type of riddle, but it also gives us an insight into how you really think as an individual. And we really look for a diverse group of students that complement one another in, in, as a class. So I saw there was another question about how many typically it would take and how many international. I don't think we think through those filters necessarily. It's more about really um, seeing who has exceptional merit in terms of uh, their academics, uh, the classes that they took, uh, what they write in their personal statement, uh, the letters or recommendations, but also what we have at Cooper Union is this so-called home test that is literally a type of meritocracy. It allows us to create an even, um, you know, level for everybody and we get to see how, you know, student A and student B answer an identical question. And, um, you know, so my suggestion would be just be yourself, you know, read those questions carefully. They are spatial riddles. And often, I think the admissions committee is most impressed by um, the ones that do something unexpected, uh, that really make us think in a different way. So um, yeah, don't be afraid to take risks. Yeah, I think just to follow up on that, I think one of the things that we, we look at the, the home tests uh, there really are, you know, for us just to get an insight into who you are, how you think, what are your skill sets. And again, like, you know, if you feel like you can't draw that well or something else, I wouldn't let that be a deterrent. We're really looking for conceptual thinking, uh, you know, um, personality, sensibility, et cetera, and how that kind of gets conveyed through the work. And so I think a big part of what we look for is actually, you know, half of it is like, you know, of course, you know, we good grades, uh, you know, um, active, except all these things are important, of course. Um, but then I think the home test really is the thing that for us, like it begins to reveal you know, aspects of you that are kind of not um, really easily conveyed through other things, right? And so, um, so I think someone asked me you know, about materials, you know, again, like whatever material that you think you're comfortable with, right? If you, you've seen home tests where, or deal any tricks, but you know, people, People are drawing everything with pen and ink. Other ones are, you know, it's all digital. Other ones where it's something else. Yeah, you know? and so like, again, like it's one of those things where it's like, how do you begin to look at and see the problem and to um, respond to it in a way that reveals something about your, your, your imaginative and creative thought processes. I would also add very briefly, I saw there was a question about literary um, courses at the school. Part of the home test, half of it is visual and the other half, or one, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is also uh, narrative and, and liter you know, we actually look at your writing, we look at how you narrate your answers to these text-driven, you know, prompts. So um, no matter what your skill set is, as Professor Lauder pointed out, uh, I would just say a leap into it and really read each question carefully. Great, thank you. Um, 
Micah, I see your hand up. I'm going to read one more question, then I'll call on you. Um, there's a question, are the lessons more discussion-based or lecture-based? Um, let's see, Gabriella, do you want to speak to this a bit? Sure, yeah. I think um, it depends on the course you're taking, but for the most part, all of your courses are going to be um, like a hybrid of the two. So you'll have a lecture usually in the beginning part, and then the professors will set aside um, a good amount of time for a class discussion. And since the class sizes are so small, um, you kind of feel like you're having a smaller group discussion rather than raising your hand in a large auditorium. Um, for studio courses, I would say they're um, completely um, discussion-based. You're either having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your professor or you're in a smaller group. And then sometimes they will give you presentations about um, precedents or other work. But for the most part, they're mostly discussion-based. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, do you wanna add just sort of what you, the way that you would teach a studio or seminar? Yeah, I, I can speak to studio and representation. And um, I think generally in, in both classes, we try to engage like a range of media or a, a range of formats. Um, so we have pinups through Miro that look at more of an overview of the work. We also have individual desk crits, which allow us to have more one-on-one -on -one time with the students. Um, in representation, we, we have um, our discussions about readings through pinups. So each review is a kind of platform to discuss, um, discuss the themes of, of the previous week's readings. Um, and we've also incorporated guest lectures into studio. So we had um, Ife Vanable uh, lecture about ritual in studio um, and Anthony Vidler who um, lectured about type and typology. So again, it's a kind of diverse range of, of formats. Thank you. Um, Micah, do you wanna ask your question? Yes. Um, one of the students talked about how, uh, how they go to the student-led discussions talking about like climate change, decolonization, and labor. I was wondering how that translates into the curriculum. I know like for the fourth and fifth year, um, we talk about like um, the thesis and then there's the um, sustainability. I wonder how um, students, how like that translates into the first and third years or if like students, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Students kind of act on that in their, in like the Cooper community as like a whole. Good question. Um, do one of the students want to talk about this, Martina or MC? Yeah, I mean, I can talk about it a bit. I think it's definitely a work in progress and we have a lot of ways to go to, you know, especially decolonize the history curriculums and stuff like that. But it's, um, at least in history, we've been having lectures about um, like the impact of slavery on, we had one on the US Capitol. And I think more than anything, there's so much of Cooper is student driven. And so, you know, we always have discussions with the Dean, with Haley and Nadir about our classes, about the curriculums. And you really just have to hold yourself as a student and your professors accountable for, you know, the, what you're seeing and what you're learning. So it's always like a discussion about what to do to bring these super important topics into, you know, what you're learning. Does yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think also like this year being online and everything, like a lot of our projects have kind of been able to like explore like in the city and like I know with history our projects um are like about a monument and we're kind of like given the prompt of what is a monument and what does that mean and like using the lectures um that we have in history and the lectures that at the school of architecture at cooper union and like bringing all of those things together and kind of like exploring that ourselves and having these discussions like in class um like almost every class i think um especially yeah yeah, and I would also add um, this year was the inaugural year, but during orientation, um, Dean Ayad initiated a 
intersectional justice reading group that was part of orientation so that all the first years came together um, in these small discussion groups that sort of mirror the humanities program, but um, she invited different speakers in from different schools. Um, so there was a much more diverse sort of discussion going on um, with people outside the institution. And um, it was the first year, but I think it's just going to develop more and more throughout the years so that you know, now everyone who comes into Cooper will have an orientation that consists of that type of programming. Um, I saw a question about electives. Um, maybe Gabriella, do you want to sort of elaborate a little bit on electives at Cooper and also whether it's possible to transfer to the schools of art or engineering? Sure, yeah. Um, I'll start with talking about electives. Um, you can, you start off by taking a humanities elective in your very first year um, in the HSS sequence, um, which stands for history and social sciences. And then beginning in your third year, you have um, the option or you, you have to take elective courses outside of the School of Architecture. So these can range from art, engineering, or um, HSS courses. And I think another um, interesting thing, I don't know if it was touched on, is you actually have the opportunity to minor um, in an area of HSS. I personally am minoring in history. Um, because those are elective courses that I took deep interest in and I, I chose to go down that path. Um, but there are a variety of my, um, minors in art history, social sciences, um, economics and history as well. Um, but if you choose to, you can take elective courses in the art school, um, printmaking, photography, drawing. In the engineering school, you can do coding. Um, and um, one of the interesting ones is like instrument design um, and acoustics. Um, there's definitely a lot of um, broad options um, for elective courses. And you take electives um, for six semesters, starting in your third year to the end of your thesis year. And then um, to touch on transferring um, into fine art or engineering, I would say it definitely happens. Um, it's not, it's kind of like a rare instance, but um, during my time here, some students have decided that architecture wasn't for them and they've transferred to um, one of the other two schools. But it's important to note, you have to reapply to those two schools and get in. Um, you can't just sort of seamlessly transfer to them. Um, but yeah, like Gabriella said, you can also take electives throughout your time um, in those schools. Thank you. Um, how much time is spent reading, writing, and discussion versus hands-on building and creating in class and with assignments? Um, Lorena or Layla, do you want to speak to that? Sure. So for reading and hands-on work, I would say it's 50-50 depending on which class you're in, such as like history, it's going to be more reading depending on who your professor is. Um, I would also say that Reading is actually, I learned this, that it's very important to do your reading in order to let it transfer over to your hands-on work. Because I was guilty of trying to like only skim my readings a little bit and then doing my hands-on work. But I soon learned that that's not the best way to go. So yeah, I would say that it's 50-50. I would allocate time for each. But of course you have to have your deliverables for your professors. So usually the deliverables are physical models or drawings. Yeah, uh, to build up on, on that, I think it's difficult, uh, especially in the framework of design, studio, design studios to uh, draw a line, uh, separating what it's hands-on drawing models from what it's like readings and other type of uh, intellectual work because somehow everything is all connected and in many cases we uh, discuss text as a tool for um, having just like a, a more deep discussion on a, on a model or on a drawing, right? So we are constantly cross-connecting uh, readings and even like uh, movies or other type of media uh, as, as we use all of that as part of our um, 
our sources in order to be creative, in order to develop our more hands-on work, like drawings or models or design. So it's somehow difficult to um, place like a, a percentage of each of the, these parts, but Laila uh, explained it perfectly well. Thank you, Lorena. Um, how supportive is Cooper with helping students with internships? Um, I'm not sure who could speak to this best. Does somebody want to take a go at it? Uh, I can speak to this. I mean, sure. I, uh, we get um, many, many students uh, trying to intern uh, throughout the years from their first year here all the way to the end. Uh, and then after they graduate, they also are looking for jobs. Um, I often uh, ask them what type of job they're looking for, uh, how they're trying to expand, uh, and then help them develop uh, at least a strategy of shortlisting a series of firms. Um, I have this technique of asking them to blind copy me on the submissions they make uh, because in many cases, we have other ways of connecting with either principals or friends within those offices. Um, that doesn't guarantee anybody work. What it does guarantee is that their submission is not lost in the sea of uh, calls and emails and uh, submissions. So we try to take a personal touch uh, towards this. Uh, and I think what really matters is that the student's work is just so extraordinary uh, that usually we hardly have to do anything. We just give them a little nudge and the rest they do by themselves. So it is a, uh, it, it is a very common thing that we do annually and uh, students take advantage of it. Thank you. Um, so there's a question, can you touch on the archive and how it actually affects students during research processes? Um, and we actually have the director of the archive, Stephen, here, so he can speak to that a bit. Sure, thank you, Maya. Uh, yeah, um, we, we have several collections in the archive, as you saw previously. And I think one of the most direct ways that we assist students uh, with their research is um, when the analysis projects take place. Uh, we may have documents in our collection, blueprints and such, that they can reference um, to start their analysis work. Uh, if they also need to kind of track down that kind of material uh, that we don't have in our collection, we can also help out with, um, on behalf of the school, um, reaching out to archives and other organizations that might have content that can help them get started with their projects. Uh, I think it's also one of those things where uh, oftentimes a faculty member will send a student downstairs to look at a previous student's design studio work or maybe a freehand drawing or advanced drawing work. And so we, you know, having our student work collection at the ready can accommodate those kinds of requests. And then I think it's just a thing where uh, when students become familiar with the archive and you know, see what kind of materials we have in their collection, that may also you know, inform uh, directions that they take in research. If it's a New York City-based project, perhaps they take a look at the uh, postcard collection, that kind of thing. Uh, and Maya, I was also going to answer, if I could, uh, a couple of the questions about working at school. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. So um, as I mentioned, my office, you know, we do work with students. Um, uh, we have student interns, we have work study interns. So the work study program does, uh, you know, we have that available at school. And I think it's a question of finding a balance of, you know, your work as a student and then um, your work either at the school or outside the school to make sure that you, you know, you don't overextend yourself. And so as an example, I can tell you numerous times uh, as we, especially as we get closer to midterms or the end of the semester, uh, students who are regularly scheduled to work often ask if they can trade a day or work a little less because they've got a lot going on leading up to their reviews. So it's a very flexible environment about finding balance. Thank you, Stephen. Um, could someone provide more information about work or study abroad opportunities. Um, Marcia, you led a trip, correct? Could you elaborate a little bit on that? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I was part of actually several trips that Dean Tarani brought to the Cooper Union recently. Um, you know, it's uh, it changes, right? Depending on, this was part of the building integrated studio in third year, second semester. 
Um, one that was really um, eye-awakening was our recent trip to Puerto Rico, where we looked at specifically housing and also the effect of Hurricane Maria and just looking at kind of the gradients of architecture through materiality and I would say also social uh, and economic challenges and learning how to design um, through those parameters and restrictions. Um, normally those traveling studios are within a specific limited uh, time uh, that they take place, meaning it could be a week to perhaps 10 days or so. Um, but what's really wonderful about them is that we also then collaborate with um, other professors in those locations as well. Um, and previously, another one that I was part of was the trip uh, with Michael Young uh, to Mexico City as well, where we looked at an extraordinary buffet of architectural <laughs> precedents as part of um, third year first semester studio that really prides itself in using analysis and kind of challenging um, you know, these kind of icons of architecture through new methods of, of uh, drawing those projects and building them as well. Thank you. Um, I have a question about supplies for prospective students. Um, so maybe Antonio, since you're new to Cooper, you can sort of describe your transition to Cooper, what you decided to get for a laptop. Um, there's a question specifically about laptops. What's recommended? Uh, um, this year, because of COVID, um, Cooper was very generous and like um, provided us with like a, like a little toolkit that was all the materials that we would need for like our first semester studio. But um, for like laptop requirements, I would recommend a Windows because that's what most of our professors use when they demonstrate things on like the computer programs like Rhino. It's really helpful like if you have the same software, but you can do like similar things with the Mac. Like I actually have a Mac, but I've been getting by, but I think Windows would be better. We also have online uh, specific uh, kind of guideline as to what kind of software and, and computers you should purchase. And as Antonio pointed out, uh, Windows is it just if you use Rhino, it gives you a larger matrix of tools uh, that you're able to um, utilize. All the plugins for Rhino on the PC side, not the Mac side, etc. Yeah. You can still use it on a Mac too, but it's half the half the options that you have on a PC. Yeah. Um, Nader, maybe could you elaborate on the sort of plan for the traveling studio and how that sort of works as our study abroad element in the school and how that will look like in the future? Um, Look, we've been rather opportunistic about these things in the past. Um, sometimes we've had visiting critics, uh, once from Mexico, uh, where the studio critics uh, took students to Ulysses, Kansas. I took students to uh, China uh, as part of a border front studio that we were doing. Uh, there were other opportunities that had to do with um, the Shenzhen Biennale. We took a couple of students there um, to fabricate um, uh, an installation uh, in one of their um, submissions. Uh, 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 Julian Palacio took uh, students to France for, um, for a series of installations in Montpellier. So, and these are um, either calls that we get, invitations that we get, uh, and conversations that we have um, with uh, a range of institutions and opportunities that take us around the world. Currently, uh, there are uh, a series of students working on projects for the Venice Biennale uh, and uh, travel willing uh, or COVID willing that there will be uh, possibly the, the opportunity to go to Venice uh, in, in about nine months. Not clear yet, but I, um, so I, I think that the question of travel is up in the air for all of us, frankly. Um, but I do think um, having a healthy conversation, not only with New York, but uh, with uh, other fronts uh, in the United States and beyond has demonstrated itself to be healthy from a certain perspective. Um, I, I also you know, want to underscore the idea that um, you know, education 
uh, has many facets uh, and the travel is really not a substitute for the kinds of intellectual commitments we have to make uh, uh, towards uh, you know, certain themes that we're trying to uh, unveil, which do not require travel. Precisely, uh, they are journeys of the mind. And so uh, I think a balance of, uh, of these programs is, is always healthy. Some of them will happen in relationship to a studio, other ones will not. They'll be winter or summer opportunities. Thank you. Um, I want to be mindful of time. We're already 15 minutes over, so maybe we can do about five more minutes of questions. Um, I'll just answer some practical ones about the transfer application. So um, transfers are welcome to apply to Cooper. They do both the studio test or the home test, as a lot of people call it. Um, and they also submit a portfolio of previous work. So first time college students don't submit a portfolio, but transfer students do. Um, if you're transferring from a major other than architecture, then that's fine. You just include sort of any sort of visual work you've done, any writing you've done, whatever the medium you were working in before. Um, and what year do transfer applicants join, trans join transfer into and how is that decided? That's really base, a case to case basis. Um, if you're coming from another accredited architecture school and you are say have done two years there, then it's possible you would be considered for third year. Um, the faculty look at your transcript and evaluate, you know, your portfolio to see if they think that you've had sort of a um, similar, you know, foundation year, second year to Cooper, and then they decide based on that. Um, sometimes you'll start in first year, sometimes in second year. Um, it also depends on the space in the studio. So our physical space in studio is limited, and that also decides our numbers sometimes. Um, and also a practical sort of data point is we have about 25 to 35 students per year. I don't know if that was clarified before, but um, it's really small classes. And so, um, yeah. Uh, a question we have is what is the course load like from year one till year five? A rough calculation of hours needed to fulfill assignments. And also maybe um, I think we could add to that. Is it possible to work while you're studying at Cooper? Um, <laughs> James, do you want to answer that a bit? <laughs> well, I mean, listen, it's, it's an intense program. You know, like, I mean, uh, I think architecture is one of the disciplines. I, I, to a certain degree, subscribe to that idea that uh, um, the Malcolm Gladwell idea that to come to develop expertise, you need 10,000 hours <laughs> of, you know, of doing something before you have expertise in something. Uh, this is architecture drawing the new from like methods of abstraction to how you hold something to um, uh, knowing the programs to do, make it do what you want to do. All that stuff takes time and repetition before you begins to get become, you know, much like if anyone here plays an instrument, you know, you can't just pick up a guitar and start playing it. You have to do your scales. And before you know it, you have a certain, uh, you start doing your scales where you're talking to somebody. In my mind, I'm pretending it's a guitar, right? Uh, if you can see my hand, right? I'm sitting there doing my scales and I'm then I start talking and I start eating my cereal and I'm always doing scales. I'm before you know it, they be, kind of become transparent to you so you can um, uh, do other things. So uh, it's it is intense, it requires a lot of focus, it requires a lot of energy. Uh, I mean, that being said. Uh, and again, again, depends on the class as well. There are certain semesters in certain classes that are more intense than others. The classes that I teach, I've heard, tend to be more intense than others. Um, uh, there have been students who have worked before uh, while doing this stuff. I think it's you know it's difficult to do, and again, like I think it's really on a case by case basis. Um, but I would say, I'm not sure that really answers your question with the sort of hard line, like. For every one hour you're in class, it's two to three hours outside of class. That's a general rule of thumb, I think. Uh, I think sometimes for design, it's longer and more. And then you also get caught in that tricky spot where like, oh, I have to be in studio late. And then the later you hang out there, you start just hanging out with people there. There's all kinds of pitfalls you have to kind of avoid. Um, but yeah, I would say like, you know, it's, it is an intense workload. Um, yeah, and for the, for the job, I currently have a job with the admissions office. Um, I know MC works 
the counseling center and a lot of people work in the computer lab as well and in the archives so you can definitely have a job you know it has to be flexible and you have to obviously give priority to your schoolwork but it's definitely possible you just have to be good at organizing your time and find priorities and, and just make time for what matters and for the work you know especially since it drawings and your projects and models sometimes it feels like they can never be done so it's really much like how much effort and time you put into it is what you receive back from your classes and your professors so you just have to find the balance and it takes time like I, I'm in second year and you just have to figure it out as you go. Thank you. Um, so it's 12.20, so I feel like we need to wrap up, but um, let's take one last question. Um, with the creation of the ACE Lab and new technologies evolving constantly overall, how does that affect the curriculum at Cooper? And <laughs> how does faculty and staff and students adapt and evolve along with these new additions to technology? So let, let me start and then I'll hand it off to Austin, if, you, if I may. Uh, uh, our engagement with technology uh, preceded uh, the ACE Lab. In a way, <laughs> much of uh, what we inaugurated with uh, uh, Austin's courses had something to do with the urgencies that digital technologies, uh, the writing of scripts, uh, algorithms, and digital fabrication has brought to uh, the research that research in architecture in general. Um, I think what was important to us uh, was to maintain the experimental, speculative, and open-ended uh, research that is associated with these things. Uh, moreover, associated with Cooper Union, to be able to uh, maintain the ethos uh, of the workshop on the fourth floor uh, once it is expanded. Having said that, there was a restructuring of the uh, workshop uh, in the first year that used to be structured around a tripole uh, series of workshops around, you know, wood techniques, you know, uh, metal and uh, casting. And now we have a sort of quadripartite uh, structure with uh, digital protocols as being one of them. But I think it's important to recognize that uh, Cooper Union is strangely agnostic with respect to uh, questions of representation. I, I liked um, Elizabeth O'Donnell's response earlier on, uh, effectively connecting us uh, to the Ice Age as much as to uh, centuries uh, that have yet to, to come. I, I think that uh, some of the great work of the students uh, bears marks of forms of representations that are not exactly distinguishable. You're looking hard to, to determine how something was done uh, and yet they're quite precise. But um, uh, I don't know if Austin is still in the room or not, but maybe yeah. he can comment more on uh, uh, other things that await us uh, with, uh, with the ACE Lab having been uh, sort of taken underway. Um, he's not here anymore, I think, but um, maybe Michael could speak a little bit briefly to that and then um, I think we'll have to end the session after Michael's remarks. Yeah, I guess I would, I would just say briefly that um, technology uh, changes in media have affected architecture continuously over hundreds of years. And so it's, it's not that a new technology comes and then it is the driver and everybody must respond, that it's a two-way exchange. And just as much as the, the changes in technology challenge us to think differently about that which we do, we in part uh, challenge the technology to do things that it did not know it could do. And in that way, we find a, a mode in which architecture and the discipline of architecture can think through the processes of making, of building, of constructing, of modeling, of simulating, of testing. And how we do that is through multiple modes of mediation, multiple technologies, multiple materials. And uh, one of the great things about having the ACE Lab is um, it expands and asks us to challenge our own discourse and our own pedagogy. And we will do that by challenging that technology to do things that 
the people who made it don't even uh, read it, which will be fun. I think so. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I think this was really great. And um, thank you so much to all the faculty and staff and students. Um, super informative and exciting. Um, and we hope that you all decide to apply to Cooper and that you all have a very fun time doing the studio test. Um, don't be intimidated by it, enjoy it, and um, don't look it up online. It's not gonna help you um, to try to copy someone else's. So um, yeah, I put my email in the chat if you have any questions while you're applying. Um, and if we didn't get to your question today, please email me. Um, and also in the follow-up email in the next few days, we should have a recording of this um, so that you can also look back at anything that you want to see. Um, but yeah, have a great rest of your Sunday and hopefully see you at Cooper. <laughs>